Hey, welcome to Talking in Stations. This is Matterall. I think you can hear me. This is December 3rd. We're going to go over some Eve news. I'm going to look around, see what I can find. There's definitely some stuff inside of Talking in Stations Discord, which is where we gather a lot of the stuff that you hear on this channel. Uh, I am back, actually, from uh, a vacation. It lasted a few months. I'll be doing shows and uh, doing a lot of um, concentration on writing. So we'll see how that goes. I'm very excited to get back to writing. That's where uh, I started talking about EVE Online. And uh, this media stuff is super fun too, so you don't want to leave that behind. So yeah, I'm going to be hanging out, and as always, on Discord and doing some shows here and just going through EVE Online news and seeing what's going on uh, inside this place. Let's start where... Mm, let's see... We we'll started talking this talking in stations discord. There was something inside the work channels. Let's see if I can. I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing this behind the scenes stuff. I'll probably get in trouble, but uh, I think it will be okay. Let's see. We'll go over here to the staff lounge. Breakdown room. First thing that popped up was this, uh, this little thing here about um, exploit. CCP put this out, I think, earlier today. Exploit declaration, abyssal siege module fit to ships other than the dreadnoughts. Please read the following article for more information. So if we chase that down, we'll find the actual, and it's funny because it has like the sheriff's badge. Uh, so this comes from the, uh, I guess it's a little role play in game, the police in game basically warning you, uh, the player, about certain behaviors. And so let's read what this is about. It has come to our attention that there is a defect which enables the Abyssal Siege module to bypass the usual dreadnought-only fitting restrictions. By the way, that means fitting basically means putting the module inside your ship to be used. And basically can be fit to some other types of ships. Effective immediately, this is now considered an exploit as ships and other dreadnoughts are not intended to use siege modules of any kind. A fix for this defect will be prepared and will be deployed next week. In the meantime, if you, we observe, if you observe players using sh a ship other than a dreadnought with a siege module fitted, actively engaging in any type of gameplay, please get in touch with our support by sending a ticket to the Rules and Policies Exploits category. Uh, it has a link there, everything in blue. So uh, this is something that's been going on, uh, people able to fit the abyssal, abyssal siege modules on other ships. Abyssal siege module, I don't know if that's an actual siege module. Is that a mutated siege module? An abyssally, <laughs> abyssal mutation? Let's have a look if there's actually something called the abyssal siege module. I think Siege is a tricky one to spell because it's... How about that? How about you spell Abyssal right? Abyssal Siege Module. There's a really easy way to do this. Copy and paste. Let's try that. Although copy and paste doesn't always behave on the Mac version of... Oh, it did in this case. Okay, I'll take the plural off that. Yeah, so Abyssal Siege Module, I don't think is an actual um, module. Let's try Siege Module and see if anything comes up there. We will have Siege Modules because they actually do exist. There's uh, Siege Module 1 and 2, and this is uh, Ship Modifications. Those are actually... Uh, let's have a look. This is a module for mutaplasmin. Yeah, I think I think these are actually mutated modules, which would account for why they're uh, able to bypass normal restrictions, and uh, and so that's probably what's going on here. If you guys know a bit more about it, let me know. They don't have comments up, but let me grab that real quick. 
then we can have a, a more information on that. But anyway, looks like people have been doing it probably for a while. Okay. Next, we're going to go to one of my favorite things, which is uh, Eve Pulse, which is tr the best thing that CCP has put out in a long time. Um, really remarkable quality on, on this thing. Let's see if we can uh, see Eve Pulse in here. Public show planning. Uh, we can go over some of the stuff that, uh, before we get to the pulse, let's look at this thing here. This is uh, Dark Horse Comics, which are actually known for doing uh, intellectual property that isn't typical. They would do stuff like Star Trek comics and, um, you know, uh, other stuff. Actually, let's look at the kind of stuff that Dark Horse does. So they don't, I, I'm pretty sure... I had a friend that worked in comics and Dark Horse does stuff that is like kind of indie. Like, uh, yeah, it looks like Hellboy products. Well, no, not drinking glasses. Comics, okay. I probably missed the, uh, wherever the, uh, see all the new releases. Well, we'll start there. Okay, that's too small for you guys to read, so I'll blow it up. And yeah, like uh, Hellboy, Asheron, uh, Sin City. These are the kind of rights that they get. So I think they buy up like intellectual properties from stuff that has uh, fan bases, and then they uh, will produce comics to further the canon and the storylines and stuff like that. They've done other things like that. In fact, they actually did stuff for EVE Online, for CCP actually. Um, before let's look here we can see eve valkyrie i think i'll just go to eve online and see if there's uh, anything under that that's interesting they're selling uh, one of the books from eve online but i think that was published by ccp maybe they had something to do with it yeah here this was a while ago when valkyrie was coming out they decided to put out a comic book series at the same time uh, they did another one here called true stories and I don't know if there was more than one episode of True Stories. That, that might have had multiple stories in it, if I remember correctly. So there's two things that they've done already uh, for EVE Online. And one is the Valkyrie comic series, which was six, I believe. And uh, they also did EVE True Stories. And uh, it looks like they had something to do with publishing a couple books, maybe three, actually. The Source, which is, uh, if you ever wanted to know like the backstory of EVE Online... Um, a little more richness about the entire setting of New Eden, then the source book is going to be what you want. It looks like they had a hand in publishing that along with Eve University Art, which is the second art book that came out about Eve Online. The first one was um, much bigger and thicker and had a lot of the old art in it. And I think this is kind of an updated version of that, but it did have some of the archival stuff and some of the concept art. Pretty good book too. And, uh, and then Frigates of Eve, which I believe they were planning on doing multiple frigates, cruisers, and so on. I don't know if that's all stopped, but it looks like CCP is working with um, uh, Dark Horse Comics again. And this time they're going to do uh, Capsuleer Chronicles. I mean, it, it kind of is like true stories of Eve, isn't it? Like you know, Eve, true stories. And uh, Capsuleer Chronicles. So maybe they've kind of resurrected that concept of telling stories that players uh, get up to and, um, and putting that out there. Eve is a story-driven environment. So comics is a natural way for, for it to find some possible new fans. We'll have to see how they do it. All right. So that's kind of interesting. Here's the Eve Pulse link I had. Let's go to the Zen channel. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Doris. I'm going to do a little critique uh, on this. It's uh, really good. Um, 
Again, the Pulse series for those that haven't been around a, a real long time is the latest in many attempts that uh, CCP, the game developer, has tried to um, to basically keep the community involved. And uh, they they had the 07 show before that. They had actual Eve TV, which was kind of it was kind of cool, kind of ahead of its time. Or maybe it was, you know, a sign of the times. But they've done over the years uh, different versions of video information about what's going on in EVE Online. I have never seen this quality, though. They've really, they've really stripped it down, saying, we're just going to do it from a development point of view, not a community point of view. We're not going to talk about um, what players get up to. We're going to talk about what we're doing, what we're producing, what we're putting out there. And that is a really... A big change from, I would say, the era of 2014 to about 2018. There was this um, development path that was very much let the players talk about the players, keep the focus on the players, let's take our logo off the videos, and let's make sure that we push the players, their stories, what they get up to, their relationships up front. And that's what we'll focus on. We'll fall back and just create the environment, just be the janitors, and that's where all that comes from. But, um, but before that, there was this attitude uh, when EVE was designed that it was a very ambitious project, uh, theoretically, right? More real than reality, it kind of was their, their logo or ethos. And they ended up um, for five, six years just throwing things at the wall, really, and just making these really ambitious expansions until they basically blew a tire. Uh, they got way too far into their what they call technical debt. I mean, they, they really just, when you do an MMORPG, everything affects everything else. And if when you have one shard that is compounded uh, because it's one world, so, um, you know, not individual servers. So now like that, that kind of balance problem becomes even more um, problematic because you have such large numbers of groups that can you know can show up in one place and and work a mechanic and overload the servers and you know, you know just a whole other thing so eve online was really kind of just ambitiously put together for the first few years then it went into kind of a okay okay we went too far uh we can't deliver on what we promised or at the time the technology we were building won't really allow us to do what we need to do to fulfill our future vision, it was called. And it was an actual trailer from CCP called Future Vision. So because they couldn't deliver that, I feel, uh, and the players got mad, and uh, this was 2011, they went into kind of a fix-it mode. And they said, okay, let's just, just we have no plan, let's just take a list of what players uh, want to get fixed, and we'll just work on that stuff, and, and we'll please and please and please the player base that we have right now so they'll stop leaving. The people were leaving like crazy. Uh, during Incarna, it's like 27,000 counts or something left within a few months or whatever. It was a bad time. So they went into this, let's just talk about the players. Let's focus on the players. Let's, let's really pamper the players. And I think one of the underlying currents of this scarcity era that we're seeing is that we're going back to, and you can mark this to when... Um, Available Hil for new caps. When, when Hilmar showed up again... I mean, there's a lot to talk about here, basically. Why don't I go into it, right? You guys have nowhere to go, so why don't you hang out with me and, and listen. But uh, around 2017, 18, you may have noticed there was a lot of sales going on. Um, you know, the, three, the 3D thing wasn't working out, uh, or the virtual reality thing wasn't working out, so they, were, um, they basically kind of wound that up. And uh, you could see in EVE Online, there was a lot of Plex sales, like one every two weeks, which was what, like, what was going on? Well, I think they were cleaning up the books, fundraising, uh, making the company look as good as it could, putting on its best suit, its best financials. And I think they were probably in, in talks with people to be bought. Uh, and at that time, you have the whole Roracle thing, right? And it seems to me that CCP... And this is just my take on it, but it seems to me like CCP was sunsetting the game, basically saying, just let players pacify themselves by gaining riches and let all that go out of control because we don't really see a future in it. We just want to sell this company. I, I kind of feel like that's where they were headed. And I'm sorry, CCP, if I'm offending you by being inaccurate about this, but this is just a perspective that 
and I can't know what you know, and I don't think you'll tell me. So I'm just going to say this is what I think was going on. But what happened was they got bought by somebody who actually cared about the game. Boom. Everything changes. The, the idea of selling it out, sunsetting it, putting it to drift. Uh, I think when they, and this is something Hilmar did say when he looked at what was going on with EVE Online at the time, the incredible quick adoption of the 64-bit client. That meant players in the game were very invested in getting, you know, really staying attached to the game, its technology, its improvement. There was a huge amount of buy-in there. On the reverse side of that, there was a ton of people checking out EVE Online constantly, 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 constantly. You'll hear them cite those numbers sometimes, you know, millions of people in the last year or uh, in two years, whatever the time figure is, but a huge amount of people are constantly coming to EVE Online, checking it out, and then saying, yeah, it's not for me or whatever, but they are checking it out. So you have a huge potential machinery of people arriving and you have people who are very committed. Those two things are powerful together. If you could just capture a fraction of the people that are coming in, a fraction more than they were, you could possibly uh, really build it into a virtual world. And then you get bought by people who have an interest in keeping it going and more, I think, learning from it. So they want to, uh, this is Pearl Abyss, the company that has Black Desert Online. It's a similar game. It's very open sandboxy, I believe. Uh, but now, now you have an interest in, well, there's a, there's a ton of business reasons they bought it uh, as far as like, you know, the um, Eve Echoes wasn't released yet. So there was potential money making there. There was also uh, Pearl Abyss is a Korean company. Uh, their ability to use Iceland or England, wherever CCP is based these days, to go into the Chinese market for video games. All that stuff was figuring into the business reasons for buying uh, EVE Online. EVE Online is also a pretty good money maker and very stable. But I think they didn't buy it for the money making, as other people have said. I think they bought it for experimentation and uh, it really fit into their portfolio of, of what they're trying to do. So I think that was very simpatico. And so... You have a, a space offering now, and then you have the um, Black Desert offering, and it just kind of works out, plus the potential of uh, additional money making. So uh, CCP is bought by somebody that kind of cares about making the game better, and that just changes the whole equation. So now I believe you have um, the CEO from CCP looking at uh, EVE Online, not just him. It's, I don't want to put it all on him, better or worse. I'm going to put it on the entire apparatus of CCP saying, let's make this game really work. Uh, let's, let's prepare it for the future. And you'll hear them saying that these days, let's prepare EVE Online for the next decade. Uh, and EVE Online will outlive us all and, and et cetera, these kinds of things. So basically they're, 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 they're turning, looking at it. They know there's people who wanna play it that are playing it. They know there are people that are coming to the game out of curiosity that could stay if they improve the beginning portion of it. That doesn't mean entice people into a game with better storyline or, um, you know, new player experience, they call it. You know, you don't want to like wow them and then have them sit in a boring game because they'll just leave a little bit later and then you've wasted a ton of money de designing this little theme park beginning, et cetera. So what they've done instead is uh, say, look, we've tried that new player experience thing. And um, what we'll do instead is we'll just look at where people are getting stuck, where they're falling out of the game, where they lose interest, where the actual little tiny microscopic uh, cracks are that people uh, get snagged on and can't go any further. And we'll just one at a time, just fix that, fix that, fix that. And that's where a lot of the effort is gone. So, um, you know, for all those veteran players, we see and talk about all the stuff that uh, a CCP Rise developer will do or a CCP Fozzy developer will do, or there's many other uh, signal. There's lots of different developers that we talk about and worry about and try to see what they're doing. And we talk to the community team. But behind all that is a major effort to improve and polish the entry points and also to pick up adjacent players. And you're seeing the Japanese localization come online, Korean localization came online just like that. And, uh, and because of that, we've seen some alliances from those regions of the world. So I think that is where a lot of the focus was. I think that's changed over time. But, but um, going back to where I was talking about the eras where you have uh, what I think Ashtarathi calls the ice castle era or ice tower, you know, 
where Vikings are making this incredibly rough and brutal dark game that is really enticing to a more introspective look at the players, look at their relationships, look at this virtual world uh, to this new era that has started maybe a year ago or two. Uh, and that era is let's fix this game for the future. How do we balance it? How do we get it back to a healthy ecosystem after we let it eat so much, right? This is the time where you're working out after Thanksgiving, after eating a ton. And that, I guess you could call it scarcity, but um, what, I, what I've seen is a new focus on the developer. And that's what I wanted to get to this whole time. I'm sorry I gave you all that. I kind of like going through Eve history, so it's fine. But um, if you wanted to, uh, you know, let me go back and grab that strand. The point of this is the, the stuff that CCP community team is, or the developers are offering now as far as keeping you informed at least on this video, this video aspect of it, the pulse is about what the developer is doing uh, to get you uh, cool stuff, new toys, cool stuff, new outfits, all that stuff. So they're basically saying, look, this is what we're doing. And every, I don't know what it is, every week, two weeks, three weeks, they took a break, but they put out a few of these. These Eve pulses are sensational. They're so polished. Uh, CCP Mirage, I don't know him, haven't talked to him. He's incredibly, he's incredibly soothing to watch play, you know, talk about the EVE Online stuff. So this is just good, really good development um, communication. So uh, EVE does communicate with players very well. And uh, this is evidence of that. So we'll watch it and then we'll see what's going on in here. Do a little reaction thing. Turn it down so I can talk over it. It's just the entry uh, video, which is also really cool. You can see they're showing off some of the skins. Uh, or that is, I believe that is the partner skin. And here's like the fictional Welcome back to GTA and another bar. episode of The Pulse, your regular source of news from inside New Eden. The Winter Status Update blog is coming soon with information on EVE's ecosystem, the introduction of new capsuleers, insight into the game's technical foundations, and a look at what's upcoming for EVE. Sincere thanks must go to all Capsuleers that have taken the time to test and give in-depth constructive feedback on the ecosystem changes on the Singularity test server. We'll stop there. That's the first point I want to make. They're communicating something here. I don't know if you caught it. By the way, beautiful graphics of gas mining. They're saying if you were someone that uh, took the time to see the changes, to go to the test center, to test those changes, to give feedback in forums, thank you. And what they're doing is they're rewarding that behavior. We saw examples of other behavior. We saw it all through di uh, our Discord. We saw it in public. We saw people writing articles about. The point is there's a lot of noise around stuff that wasn't even that well understood. And what, what CCP is doing is saying, we, we did open ourselves up to feedback on these meg you know, gigantic changes for mining. And uh, we, we definitely put it out right away on the test server in an unfinished almost way so that you could play with it and you could uh, give us, they could crowdsource, but CCP could crowdsource the players for a better product. And the people that did that the right way, thank you. That's what they're saying here. They're not saying, hey guys, we heard you. They're not saying that. They're saying if you said, uh, if you gave constructive feedback, if you were on the test server, they're conditioning who they're thankful to. And by omitting who they're, uh, who they're saying thank you to, if you look at the, uh, what I call the negative space, they are not saying anything about uh, people who were um, going to forums and writing a bunch of trashy, uh, angry stuff. So I think what CCP is doing here is saying, we're gonna highlight the players that are willing to work with us as a partner. And uh, for the people who, who just want to yell, those are people that won't be heard and won't be thanked, won't be singled out. So I think that's interesting. The language there does say something. We'll hear that again. On the ecosystem changes on the Singularity test server, please continue to join the discussion on the forums and check out the blog for details of how these changes are evolving, how new players receive a better onboarding process today, and how investment in technological foundations will set EVE up to thrive into its third decade. The fusion of festivities that is the Winter Nexus series of events is returning to EVE on the 9th of December. 
As part of the Winter Nexus, there will be free daily login gifts, the Chilling Spree daily challenges, White Storm combat and exploration sites, traveling volatile ice storms and filaments, plus a few surprises. The Capsule Chron Most of that stuff, by the way, I think was here last year, and it was an incredibly, incredibly lucrative time in EVE Online. If you get involved in this Christmas special or whatever, uh, I think you'll find that you can make a lot of money uh, in, in EVE Online, basically, a lot of ISK. Uh, it was by far the most rewarding of uh, the events. I think we heard CCP Fozzy, the developer of, on the events team, or one of the developers, say that they wanted to make Christmas, uh, you know, give a lot of presents out. So I encourage you to get involved with that if you can. I think it would probably it would probably be um, worth your while if you do active gameplay, go out, run missions, do the things they're talking about. Uh, you'll probably make a ton of money. If it's like last year, we don't know. They said there's a few surprises. I'm sure they're mutating it uh, to try new experiments uh, for players. So that is the winter uh, event that's coming up soon. I don't think they've actually announced it yet, though. All right, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm sorry, we'll get through the pulse. I'm going to pause a second because I just put up the uh, chat and I want to talk with you guys. So I'm looking for questions if you guys have any. And uh, okay, Jor Zabo says, only missing Spanish. He's referring to the Spanish language localization. Why can't we play this game in Spanish? A lot of people who would play. It's 400 million Spanish speakers in the world. Those are pretty good adjacent users. Uh, look into that, CCP. Eve Echoes had Spanish. Heck, I think they even had like Portuguese or something. Uh, okay. Um, if you guys have questions, go ahead and put them down. I'm looking through. I don't really see other questions, but uh, I might be missing some. All right. Let's go on with Capsuleer. Uh, sorry, the Pulse. And uh, this is CCP Mirage who's talking here in the bar, in the space bar. By the way, you're gonna see you guys see a little animated lady walk by, and I was I was looking at that and I was thinking, that's amazing. Look how real that looks. Um, and then I looked at the other two that are just sitting in the background. And I was like, those lonely people, they're just what are they doing just sitting there by themselves? Nobody's talking to them. All right, let's go on. A new Eve Online comic developed in partnership with Dark Horse Comics has just been released. The first chapter in the four-part series focused on the Triglavian invasion of Raravos, is available online digitally right now for free, with the rest of the series to be released throughout 2022. Check out the link in the description below to download Chapter 1. As part of the ongoing efforts to improve the new player experience, some small changes have been made to career agents and new player-friendly skill plans have been added. Career agent paths have been renamed to align with the four main career paths as outlined in EVE Academy, Explorer, Enforcer, Industrialist, and Soldier of Fortune. We'll stop there because they're going on to something else that uh, is important. I didn't know that. So you're going to see, uh, I think what's happening right now is they're, they're adapting a lot of old language to um, a new, um, basically a new categorization of language. And that's for newer players that are coming in because they want to bridge as much knowledge as they can for early players. In other words, if you come into the game and you start hearing about the, um, the genre of jobs associated with exploration, they should be using that word exploration every time they're referring to that, that genre, uh, instead of changing the word or inserting new words into that uh, discipline. So I think you're seeing a lot of nor not normalization, but I would call it normalization of language and categorization so that uh, conceptually, conceptually when players come into EVE Online, there's some consistency throughout their middle career. And, and I think that's what's going on here, especially um, <clears throat> with this next point, which is, uh, I believe it's skill plans for corporations to hand out to their members, which is very helpful. It's basically saying, here's what you should be doing. Train these things and, and then play with us. Each career agent will offer a new skill plan constructed from the initial skills available for new capsuleers, giving them what they need when embarking on the adventures provided by the relevant career agent. Corporation skill plans will be going live in client on the 7th of December. Player corps will be able to create, manage, and share skill plans suited to their own needs and activities. As a result, a new corporation role will also be added, the skill plan manager. This update will also contain further improvements to the skill plans feature in response to capsule feedback, so keep an eye on the patch notes. 
Going back to the investment in EVE's tech foundations, it's time to bid farewell to DirectX 9, support Ooh. for which will be discontinued in January 2022. When I started EVE Online, DirectX 9 was like the latest thing. <laughs> it's weird to see it go because it was so... Uh, I played again on a Macintosh and it didn't have that. So I was playing, you know, the genuine potato mode things where everything wasn't shiny. And then <clears throat> I had two machines. So then when I played on the PC, uh, I would be like, wow, everything looks great. Everything is shiny. And it was partly because of DirectX 9. That is being discontinued, uh, again, in an effort to modernize the game. Uh, they're just starting to leave people behind, which is kind of interesting because one of the things that was really cool about EVE Online, besides the fact that it had a Mac client, a Linux client, at a time when most groups were, most developers were giving, you know, stopping development for those platforms, the fact that it had that was pretty cool, but um, the the other thing was that it didn't take a strong machine to play EVE Online, which is really good for an MMORPG where people don't have current technology or the latest technology or it's expensive. And so you don't want to price people out of your game, especially an MMO where you need a population. So uh, the fact that they really let uh, really low and inexpensive technology play EVE Online back in the day was a really good thing. Uh, I think we're starting to get to the point where um, you have to let some of those old uh, pieces of technology fall away in order to improve the game, to look a certain way, to be modern enough and that sort of stuff. Plus you're coming into now a whole new arena of streaming EVE Online, which you know you can do. Now you can play EVE Online in a browser, get the beautiful high resolution graphics in a browser. It's expensive for them to uh, to let you do that. So if you don't play for 15 minutes, or if you're sitting idle for 15 minutes, it will disconnect you or something. I don't know. It, it gets disconnected pretty quick because it's expensive. Um, but you're seeing that, that uh, you, the limitations of a home computer are starting to get displaced by technology moving to having good streaming as opposed to having a really strong video card. So there's, there's that coming in at the same time that CCP is uh, starting to let go of a lot of that old um, um, ability of old computers to play the game through the normal client. This will be the catalyst for future graphics engine improvements and optimization, as well as a great many opportunities for higher fidelity visuals in the future. Check out the blog link below for full details of the deprecation. The Zakura Anniversary Bundle, celebrating one year of Japanese localization in EVE Online, is now available in the EVE Store. The bundle contains one month of Omega, Plex, 50,000 skill points, plus the Zakura Shumyu skin for the Caracal and the Vexel. In addition, Zakura Shumyu skins for Marauders and Select Battleships have returned to the New Eden Store. Both the bundle and the skins are only available until the 13th of December. EVE Down Under took place as an online-only event on the... Eve Down Under is an Australian, um, basically Australian meetup for the uh, entire continent, basically. And um, you know, if you don't know this about Eve Online, some of the best and most dedicated players come from Australia, and uh, they're and they're the, they're kind of like the uh, the step. I don't know if that's the right way to say it anymore, but the stepchild uh, or. You know, they're the ones that had to put up with the downtime in the middle of their in the middle of their gameplay time, like 6 p.m. or whatever. That was when the servers would die and then they would come back. So Australian players were uh, inconvenienced more than anybody else. And they were still some of the most hardcore enthusiastic players out there. And one of the things that's uh, that shows that is the uh, Down Under podcast that came out from there. And uh, some of the meetups they would have and the communication, and they were just really supportive of CCP. And CCP returned a lot of attention to them by um, actually sending people down to Australia for this, uh, for this convention that happens once a year. And it became one of the four conventions, really, of EVE Online per year. Kind of fell into that cycle. I don't know if it was actually ever officially adopted as a CCP event, but it was pretty close. And when they did their world tour, uh, down under or Australia was on the list of, uh, of I think six places that they went to. 20th and 21st of November with CCP Convict and CCP Larrikin in virtual attendance. Check out the stream on CCP TV for the developer chat and AMA. Both those guys, Larrikin and um, Convict were 
both Australian, and both of them were in NC dot, and they were in a corporation called VDD Van Diemen's Van Diemen's Van Diemen's demise. I love those guys, and um, yeah, so they were kind of the nighttime NC dot uh, group. They went over to PL for a little bit, but I always considered them NC. They ended up returning to NC dot, which is where they're at. But both those guys got recruited out of there. I joined NC dot. I actually applied to VDD. And the person that applied right in front of me was CCP Convict. Uh, he was known as Bam, Bam Stroker at the time. Uh, Larrikin actually was an FC, a fleet commander for Super Capitals. Uh, he was known as Dark Razor. And both those guys have jettisoned their CC, their EVE Online identities because now they're developers. So they, they probably don't want to talk about their past. But, but they were there. And uh, Larrikin, I think, did a ton of work in the Fountain War for NC Dot. He was uh, he was in on killing, uh, uh, um, which was very hard to do at the time. He killed a base, uh, uh, what do you call it, a station or an outpost in its infancy because it would pop out as an egg and then it would uh, form. But if the egg popped out and enemy forces were around, you could destroy the egg and that station would just die. And so uh, I, I was in on that fleet and Larrikin was uh, the FC. So both these guys, again, NC dot VDD great group, and uh, and uh, but now they are CCP guys and they uh, put together this down under. So uh, actually, Bam was a, a found one of the founding guys of it. If not, he was instrumental in getting it really really going. And something you should know about Convict before he was ever part of CCP, he's an incredibly dedicated Eve player. Would fly around the world really. To, to go to EVE events and hang out with EVE players. And, you know, this was all on his time and it's all his effort. Uh, and if there was any meetup in Australia, he would, he would fly that meetup. So very dedicated to hanging out with other EVE players. And so it was really a no-brainer to put him on uh, as actual staff, which happened rel relatively recently, only a couple of years ago. Some close battles in the PvP tournament. And don't miss the community beat for more EVE community happenings. That's all for another episode of The Pulse. Thank you for joining Aww. us. Remember to check the Very description well. below for more information on the stories that we've covered. Hit subscribe and the bell icon to stay notified of any new content that we post. See you next time, Capsuleers. He didn't actually do... Uh, Mirage usually does a little funny thing at the end. So I'm subscribed, but I'm going to turn on this bell. I think it was already on, but just in case. I don't want to miss any more of those. Those are awesome. All right. What else we got here? Let's see. All right, we'll go to Dotland, see what's going on. I think there was just a fight recently in... I have some info. Let's see. Rotasi, I think. Let's go there. Okay. Otsatsi, I, you know, uh, yeah, Ots Otsasi in Lone Trek, which is probably near, yeah, uh, near Tribute uh, and basically the Forge. There's a little, I, I don't know if you're familiar, if you guys are familiar with this area of uh, Lone Trek. Basically, Lone Trek bumps into the Forge in the northern part of it, right underneath Tribute and Vale. So these four areas kind of come together right in this area here. Nolvola, actually, which had a big battle yesterday, used to be right here, uh, but it got picked off by uh, Triglavians, and so it got snatched into Poshvin. So it no longer belongs to Lone Trek, uh, but it was part of this little area here that is is a real... I don't know, a uh, real freeway or uh, I don't know if I don't know if freeway is a global term, but it's a, it's a highway mm, between the forge or Jita and the northern territories. And there are like four or five of those. So for, you know, when northern coalition, I'm talking about the old northern coalition lived. Let me just take you to the universe map. So this will make more sense. Yeah. So this area up here in the north, um, has had, you know, big empires kind of sit on it. And one of them was, um, well, there was, I won't go too far back. We'll go to recent history, which is still 10 years ago. 
and talk about Northern Coalition. And it was uh, Morsis Mihi and Razor and these groups that used to be really huge at the time. Uh, there was many other ones, uh, but they were smaller. And uh, they all sat up there. They were called the Northern Coalition. And um, they used to get messed with a lot because they were kind of what uh, Imperium is now is kind of a big group of um, what were perceived as kind of farmer types. And so they would get raided a lot by, the, you know, the Vikings and people who wanted to, to pick on them to, to get some fights. You know, that's always what the excuse is, right? But uh, the Northern Coalition was, was pretty heavy in, in, in builders, so they built a lot of capital ships. They were able to defend their space fairly well. And, uh, and there's all kinds of history there I won't go into, but that was one empire that sat up there in Tribute and Vale and Avenal. And, and then they would fight in Pure Blind. That was kind of like their hunting grounds. I'm talking about this area here. So Pure Blind, it still is. Uh, Pure Blind, Fate's too small, but Pure Blind is like a battleground area. And you go into like uh, Cloud Ring and Outer Ring and Syndicate. And these areas here have a lot of NPC uh, space. I think Syndicate is all uh, NPC. I think Or is too. You can't really conquer stuff here. Like if we go to uh, IHUB owners, there's no IHUBs here. So you can't really conquer this area. So that means that it's a really good place to kind of roam around. And so this is kind of where, really where North meets South, uh, because you have the South uh, in Delve period basis come up through Fountain, which was an... Fountain you could conquer, but Fountain is kind of a, was always known as a hunting ground. When PL owned it, it was, it was just kind of a place where they, they hunted, and it's hard to hold. Uh, but that leads right into these NPC areas, which makes Syndicate very much a place where you, you go to find fights and do stuff like that. You, don't, you, you used to conquer moons, but you couldn't really conquer much else except stations and just be local. You couldn't really, uh, in, in modern times, you, couldn't, you can't really conquer it. And Cloud Ring and Pure Blind kind of sit, uh, you know, as, as also areas that are usually farmed or you know, fought over. But that leads to Tribute and Vale, and uh, up here you have Deckline and Branch. Venal also is NPC space. Somehow, uh, Venal, again, it was, it was kind of one of those areas that was smothered all the time. It's not known as a hunting ground because I think you need to go through other people's territory even to hunt in that area, so it's not easy to do. So it's more of a ratting haven, and so is Branch and Tenal for that matter. Uh, but below Tribute, which is one of the gems of the North, home of uh, Fraternity, right? If you ever heard me and uh, Naro's talking about the map, he's like, Tribute, I've always wanted to own Tribute. <laughs> and now he does, you know, as leader of Fraternity. Um, but that calling to Tribute is it's kind of the, one of the crown jewels, you know. Some people can say Deckline up here because it's more defensive. But if you really want to, like, control territory, and you would want uh, Tribute Pure Blind. And maybe Veil. Vale. But that meets up here with Lone Trek and the Forge. So all these areas kind of come together. All in this little area here. Let's go to Lone Trek. So you have um, the OB here, which belongs to the Forge. And you have Tribute here. Uh, MTech. Oh, this is where NSH just basically uh, got betrayed recently and lost their Keepstar. That's, uh, that's the system. Very, very notable system. You've seen one of the first keep stars was destroyed that was actually defending itself there. It belonged to CO2. So even before that, tons of history in MTAC O. It was the headquarters of PL mostly for the last, before Fraternity got there. Uh, Tribute was also glassed or just wiped out by uh, the Imperium when they brought a thousand Titans up north. It was kind of a sign the game was broken when you have that many Titans uh, in in one, in one movement, uh, the game was destabilized at that point. Um, funny enough, and then when you see the opposite effect, uh, you have the thousand titans of uh, Imperium clashing with everybody else's titans, and you see this giant titan fight that happens, and hundreds and hundreds of titans are destroyed, and nothing changes. That tells you the game was busted, and remains busted. Uh, Except that now those things are all so expensive, people don't want to lose them, so they're kind of put away. That's kind of a good thing. So they got, CZP got rid of Titans without really getting rid of Titans. Without taking them away, they made them too precious to lose. And that's kind of interesting. Okay. 
Going back here, so Novola last night, there was a big fight. I believe it was um, Rote Capel had a four to Czar in the same system, I believe, with their enemy, what I believe would be Fraternity. So you had uh, Rote Capel bring out some dreads and defend their, their uh, structure yesterday with good effect. And they actually, it was an armor timer, and they managed to put it into repair. Therefore, it's saved. It'll live to fight another day. Uh, and then today in Otatsi, I think Snuff uh, was trying to put down, uh, I'm not sure I have that right, but I think they were trying to put down uh, structure and uh, were, did not, were rolled back. So I don't think that worked out. Let me go to my sources here in case I'm getting stuff wrong. All right. Uh, Break room. Yeah, Snuff, I think, didn't take the fight today. So let's go into Atasi. Uh, you can see there were some jumps, uh, like over 500 jumps in the last uh, hour or so. This is about when it happened. Uh, but you don't see a, a, a ton of casualties. Uh, so I don't think the fight actually did happen. Mm -hmm. Well, well, look, uh, again, Snuffed Out is kind of the lords of uh, low sec. They, they spoil, they literally come through the park and step into your cake. Uh, that's what they do. And they love that reputation. Uh, they have, it, it's interesting. I have seen them be constrained. I don't know if they care about their public image. They're always trying to be bad boys, but I, I think there is some constraint there. It's just, um, you know. Uh, part of their image is to to be a spoiler to come into an area and try to get some fights and stuff like that but uh i think they're not completely out of control there are groups that are completely out of control i don't think snuff is so anyway snuff trying to get it into a fight with the fraternity fraternity proving to be very strong um so uh i don't know how how that's going to pan out they are not friendly to one another and um uh, Rote capel though is also more or less at war with uh, fraternity. So there's a lot of, I guess, uh, friendships to be made between a group like a Rote Capel and Snuff. They don't, may not like each other, but they're gonna both fight against a fraternity group. All right. Going through a bunch of names. If you don't know what these names are or what they mean and stuff, I can explain that stuff uh, later on. So that was going on recently. Let's go back to the map and let's just take a look at some of the numbers that are going on. <coughs> Excuse me. I was looking at top SOP changes. And I noticed Dread Bombs dropping systems left and right. I think those were systems they didn't really want to take. They were absorbing a lot of systems. Maybe they were trying to rent them out. Why not? have them. Uh, you can see here they've dropped 13 systems. Let's move over to the, here. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, Volta also dropping uh, some systems. Let's take a look at where those systems were. Uh, this looks like they're moving away more than losing stuff. Be wrong. Um, toilet paper, I believe, is a French outfit. Um, and here's something interesting. You see Reckless Contingency losing uh, six systems. I believe those are in cash, 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 whatever you want to call it. Those went to Northern Coalition because Reckless Contingency basically was invited to join uh, NC DOT. And, um, and so they did. Now, Reckless Contingency were the marshals. They were the police of the drone regions. Uh, they were policed. The drone regions are here. Uh, this area a few years ago was controlled by Pandemic Legion and Northern Coalition. There was probably some money splitting going on. Horde got a piece of that action too. They were the armies that would protect the region as a whole if anything happened. But it was rich farmland and it was patrolled by uh, recon, basically. This is after the Russians kind of lose control of it to wormholders that have come up and 
not wormholers, but people who came through wormholes and destabilized the region and then ended up owning it. And then they uh, left the game because uh, they didn't like the way the game was being developed. I'm talking about skill, uh, your skill or self. And after that, it settled to uh, NC dot kind of gained control of it again with PL. And uh, again, you've always had bot in there. That's the rental group. So if I'm an EVE Online player, I come into the game. I have about six months experience. I'm starting to get my feet. Um, you know, I'm starting to get on my feet and I realize I want to go to NullSec, but I don't really want to join a big group. I have a little corporation of friends. What can I do? Well, there's obligations everywhere. It's as Dirk McGurk calls it, uh, what is it? Cash, grass, or ass. <laughs> and, and that's like from the sixties or whatever, if you were hitchhiking. So now that I think about it, it's really awful. Uh, scratch that. So basically means one way or another, you're going to pay for that ride. And that's how EVE Online works. If you're an EVE Online player, one way or another, you're going to pay for that territory. And so I think in some ways, renting is the most honest way of living in NullSec because somebody else has conquered that territory and holds dominion over it. But they don't have the farming lifestyle, the harvesting, the building aspirations that you might. So what you do is you rent it from them uh, and you pay them for the privilege of not being moved off the land. That doesn't mean they're going to come and defend your structures if your structures get into trouble. It doesn't mean that you have unmitigated uh, license to do whatever you want. For instance, you may not be able to build capital ships, at least it was that way because they don't want you uh, using the territory that they've conquered to build capital ships that they might have to fight one day. So they may restrict that. You may have to pay extra. You may have to be monitored on who you sell it to. You may have to sell it to them as an obligation, these kinds of things. Uh, but as a renter, you would live up in this area, which is kind of out of the way, except for wormholers every once in a while. And you could basically uh, just get on with your gameplay, not worry about war, and not worry about the commitment of having to get into a fleet to go and fight, right? So other groups, like if you belong to an NC dot group or a PL group or a horde group, let's go with horde, that's probably the better example, then you have to basically, you have to basically, I don't know what that was. You have to basically, uh, you're not paying rent. You get to live there for free. You get to use all the, you know, all the facilities and everything. But you have to show up when it comes time to defend the place. So the uh, you're going to pay one way or another. Either your commitment to show up and to fight and to defend or to to help the FCs do what they need to do militarily to control an area or even just to, to live in the area. Like you're going to have to pay, your, your time's going to have to, to go there. You don't have to pay ISK to live there to rent, but you do have to pay with your time and your uh, focus. And you have to make sure that you have the right equipment to participate in that sort of thing. So that's how it works. Uh, you're either in a group and your time is taxed or you're out of a group and your territory is taxed. It's kind of one or the other. There are groups that will try to live without paying a landlord. <laughs> There's a, what's funny about Eve is when there is a war that begins, uh, a lot of people stop paying rent, hoping that their benefactor is too busy fighting a war to collect the money. And uh, and usually when the war is over, that, per that, that group will come back and be like, you're evicted. You didn't pay us. You, tr you try to stiff us. Uh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. As LB says, uh, there is like a, uh, uh, you know, we mimic society. If, if you look at all aspects of EVE Online, there's some that are front running societal changes, right? But most of the time, we're just a reflection of society that you know, we act like we act like lawyers. We act like uh, military guys. We act like, you know, we act the way that the real world um, has demonstrated works. And, and that's what you try to that's, you know, that's what you're trying to emulate in EVE. You're trying to do it in an unprofessional, without the stakes of being a, a professional thing. You know, if a corporation falls apart in EVE Online, 
it's all right. It's not, not that big a deal. But you can practice being a CEO, running people, telling them what to do, and you're only 15 years old. And that's invaluable to some. But we are reflecting society more, I think, than front-running it and, and designing it. One of the exceptions to that, I think, is the communications that EVE Online players use are front-running what companies are using. Uh, so we're, we're way into remote, working remotely with, and collaborating internationally way ahead of uh, the other group. Okay, so Recon was a group that were the marshals that patrolled uh, this area here for bot, lo bot, um, for bot Lord. Was it Bot Lord? No, not Bot Lord. Those were Accords, uh, but for Bot, B-O-T. And that was um, the rental group that you joined if you wanted to pay rent to Pandemic Legion or Northern Coalition or Horde. But none of those groups want to patrol this area. Uh, so what they had was a group that, um, that did that for them. And then they got tired of being the police. They wanted to be, you know, they wanted to do different things. So they ended up saying, look, we're no longer going to be the marshals of this area and just fight, you know, local threats to farmers. Instead, we're going to form our own alliance called Recon, Reckless Contingency. And we're going to become a full-fledged you know, like alliance in our own right, but we'll be allied with uh, the people we work with. And that's what they did for a couple of years. They were involved in the big war that just happened. Uh, but as all alliances, uh, you know, they lose people, they lose momentum. And so uh, because of the close connections, Reckless Contingency basically merged into Northern Coalition. They were invited to join. I, I want to make that explicitly clear. The leader of uh, Reckless was Apollo 428, is or was. I don't know if he still is. And he said we were invited to join and we didn't. We were not obligated to join them, which is kind of weird. I don't think you can obligate people to join. But uh, I guess he wanted to put an end to that rumor. I've never heard that rumor. There you go. So uh, Reckless Contingency losing six systems, Northern Coalition inheriting those systems. I think they traveled with the corporation that joined. Red Bomb, not heard. I thought they were losing some people, I'm not sure. Well, and here is the, uh, the second data point for Northern Coalition picking up recon. That's 1,690 uh, new people are basically recon, I think, uh, merging in there. So that, that finishes off that. The initiative looks like they picked up some people. I believe they picked up a very large corporation from Brave Collective. You can see that uh, the initiative picks up 1,300 uh, characters. Brave Collective loses over 1,000. That's that exchange. Uh, we know that VVV3, or VVV, as it was called, uh, Vinay... Veni Vidi Vici, which is actually a Chinese group, but that's Italian, isn't it? Uh, I never understood that. Pretty much folded. Uh, I think they were allied, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, I really don't remember. They were part of uh, the kind of the north. And I, I think they stayed there. Yeah, I think Dracaris, the other Chinese groups... Uh, uh, were part of the Imperium, but uh, I think VVV was part of friendly with a fraternity. They kind of lived above them. So I think they might have merged there, some of those players, which makes sense. Speak the same language. That's what's going on there. And if I look at, by the way, you can get to most violent systems here. Oh, all right, well, listen, I got to go. I've been here too long, but I do want to show you one more thing before I run. And that is, if you're not doing this already, you should be. Bring up some EVE Online. Yeah, so... <laughs> there's something happening, as you know. There is a... Um, I believe on the 7th, that's my guess. It's a guess. I believe there's going to be a new update to EVE Online, so... That makes sense because, uh, you know, there's just some dates that line up. But probably really soon you're going to see the expansion hit that changes uh, mining. And there have been some updates to it and updates to the updates. And 
it's kind of hitting its final form before it comes into the game as official policy and, and all that. But one thing they've said from the very beginning that has not changed is that skills associated with reprocessing and mining were going to change. And there was going to be a full refund of the old skills. And then those, un, you know, that refund was going to be unallocated skill points, which you can put anywhere you want. So if you wanted to get out of mining, you could, right? That was your way out. So for people who trained up a bunch of reprocessing skills to do high level mining, and they realize they don't want that gameplay anymore, you're going to be refunded those skill points and you can put them anywhere you want. If you want to continue mining, there's a whole new group of skills and you can put all your skills back into those and basically be the same as where you were before and even have a few extra skill points. They made that clear. So this is kind of a good thing. So one of the things that I advised early on was uh, anytime CCP says we're going to refund skill points, you want to get in on that. Whether you're a miner or a PvP -er or an explorer, or whatever, you want to get in on unallocated skill points. And the reason is those are flexibility skill points. They're like, I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but they're like stem cells, right? They can be used in different ways, uh, but they are, they count one to one. You don't, you don't have any, you don't lose anything. So if I have 10 skill points that are unallocated, when I allocate them, there is no penalty. So I get 10 skill points in star, starship management, or I get 10 skill points in science, whatever. Uh, there's no deduction, no penalty. And for, for players that are injecting, there's no penalty for the first you know, part of your career but the penalties start coming in later, which means that if I use a skill injector, I only get 150,000 skill points when I, when I bought 500,000. So you can see there's a 70% loss um, of skill points that are just, they just go into the ether. So anytime an advanced player, someone who has over 80 million skill points, right? Because that's when you get penalized hard. Uh, anytime you can grab unallocated skill points, you want to grab those. And uh, <clears throat> what I advised early on, if you were part of Talking in Station, was to get in on uh, ramping up, revving up your skill points as quickly as possible in the stuff that was going to be refunded if you didn't already have it. If you already have it, you don't need to worry about it. You're going to get a bulk of unallocated skill points. But if you didn't, you should have been, been trying to uh, get these specialized processing skills because these are the ones that are going away. Not the reprocessing uh, or there's a few that, you know, that are just kind of base, base level stuff. Those are not the ones you want. You want uh, the, the Kernite processing skill, Jaspit processing skill, um, Fight. You know, these are the ones that you wanted to get. You should be training those now because once they go away, those skill points that you trained up, they're, uh, they're good. Make sure I don't want the, I forget. Does anyone know how to get rid of the transparency? This is so stupid. I can't believe it's not fixed yet. That transparency there, I want to get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> and, in, and it's a weird setting, so I don't know what's going on. I believe it is. No, I can't think of how, how that transparency happens, but it's not turn off transparency. It's something else, so I'll, I'll never figure it out. In time. Let me make sure I'm looking at chat here. So I'm going to tell you how you can actually earn those skill points as quickly as possible. And this may be for some advanced players. It may not be for everyone. This is kind of an expensive proposition. Uh, and there are some cheap ways to do it or cheaper ways to do it, but it's still kind of an expensive proposition. So this is unfortunately kind of a luxury luxury advice uh some of this you can do some of the, some of it is just it's, it's expensive so the first thing you want to do is you want to remap to the attributes that train these skills right so the skills the sorry the attributes of your personality these are the old old ways of doing things but the the attribute the primary attribute is memory so you want to get memory as high as you can the second thing you want to do is get the secondary attribute as high as it can go, and that's intelligence. So you want memory, you want intelligence. That's what you're focused on for these processing skills. 
So the first thing I would do is fill up the queue with processing skills, as many as you can put, so you don't have to worry about it. You constantly want to train those specialized processing skills. Then you want to hit this remap button. The remap button allows you to take points from other areas into an unallocated pool. See those green lights down here that are filling up? These are unassigned attribute points. And then it allows you to put them somewhere else so you can shift them. And what, what this was was a gimmick to let players um, basically do a year working a certain way with uh, you know working on their drone skills for a year. And then you finish that, you don't want to be stuck with attributes that favored that learning speed. So CCP put in remaps so that you could say, this year I'm going to really focus on my piloting skills. So then you could take all your memory points and put them into perception, which is what's needed for flying. That's what the remap was made for. And you get one remap per year, and you could hold on to two of them, I think, max, or three. Anyway, so you want to pump those into your memory and your intelligence. The uh, other stuff that you can do is augment yourself with implants. And the uh, highest implant you can f get is the improved, but there's definitely like, you know, at least four versions of it. There's many more versions, but... So for memory, for instance, um, there's a memory augmentation implant and uh, it'll give you, uh, the, the improved version gives you five. I think the, you know, whatever the prototype is will give you four. And then, you know, you can just buy whatever you can afford. I think it gets down to as little as five, 10 million uh, for plus three or something. Why don't we check that since we're in the game? So I'm going to go to the memory augmentation. You can see there's a ton of different implants and, and you really just want the ones that are straight, you know, memory. They say memory here. <clears throat> so the limited memory, the, those are 1 million. Uh, and the uh, standard gives you, I think, a plus four. Those are about 20 million. I think that's reasonable. For some people to get into and this gives you a plus four points which is really good <sighs> wish i could unplug that phone so <clears throat> you know if you're just starting out you want to get um, the skill that allows you to put in implants uh, in order to use these there is a skill requirement skill uh cybernetics right and uh, you only need one cybernetic level one cybernetics to put in implants until you get to the higher level implants, then you need uh, better skills. So you have to train it, but these are only 1 million. So, you know, that's something thing is implants will die. If they pod you, uh, either NPCs or players destroy your pod, the implants blow up with you and you have to buy them again. So the other thing that you want to do, cause now you got implants. That's great. Plus five to memory. And I remapped, so my memory is, you know, the highest it can be. Um, there's still more that you can do. And one of those things is these uh, boosters. They're kind of like drugs, I think. And uh, they're called radiance boosters. Now, there's different types. There's different types of boosters that are, these are called accelerators, actually. So they work like boosters, but they're called accelerators. Where is it? There it is. I'll just type it in here so you can only see the radiance ones. Radiance, not ants. Thank you. There they are, three of them. So these were given out for the Halloween event. Now they're given out during events and they change. Sometimes they're really good and sometimes they're okay. And so these three were actually given out as loot uh, over, the, over the Halloween event. And so they're on the market right now. But here's the trick about these. They expire. And they expire in a few days. I believe they, uh, let's see. The description will tell you December 7th is when they expire, which means they become useless after that. So if you spend money on these implants... You want to use, you want to click the button before December 7th, before December 6th downtime, 
December 7th start time. So December 6th is really your deadline. Don't let that day finish without you eating up, uh, you know, these, these boosters. After that, they're useless. There are some that don't have that. Uh, I'll talk about those in a minute. But these are um, pretty cool because when you take them, they boost, they give your, they give you points across the board on everything. So uh, see all the modifiers here? That's for all attributes, eight points for one day. And you can, of course, make that, you can extend that one day into more time. So that's like, you know, that's like uh, two standard implants in your, in your head. In addition to this, to the implant, it's like, uh, you take a, a a plus four to plus 12. So it's definitely worth taking, but it only lasts one day. So you have to kind of keep taking it, which gets expensive because these things are right now about 70 million. They will go down in price as December 7th gets closer and closer. They've been, they've been going up in price, as you can see, but they, they should probably go down in price pretty soon because you... Um, Maybe it's just like uh, for these things, since they only last one day, they may go down in price about two days before the deadline because everybody's going to want to be selling them because they become useless after that. So. so there's one. Okay, so there's three different types. And what you want to do is use the uh, potent one, about 70 million. You only need one per 24-hour cycle. If you have the skill called biology, you can make that 24-hour cycle longer almost uh, two days basically so you can you can have that bonus for longer and in order to help your biology effect uh there's this implant here uh oh no that's the booster there's this implant uh called uh the alchemist biology and that implant will uh, increase your ability to to get more usage out of a booster by 10%. So basically, if you have this implant and you have your biology skill to five, you can double the effect of a booster. So whatever was good for one day, it's now good for two days. And it's a good way to get a better return on your investment since the booster costs, in this case, 73 million. Um, if these things run out, so the radiance is what I suggest you get now, but um, there's another one here called the Man Master at Arms Accelerator. Same exact thing, except it doesn't expire. It will cost more, I believe. Um, and it gives you a plus 10 right now. So, uh, so that's good. So plus 10 lasts one day with biology two days. Biology and an implant. And so you're running at plus 10. So you have your normal attributes. You remap to memory to get that speeding up. Uh, you put in a standard implant or an improved implant, and then you boost, and then you increase your biology to hold on to that boost as long as you can. And all that combined uh, gets you pretty far up there. I believe I'm at like 42 points, uh, 42 skill points, I believe. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so character. Tributes. Yeah, you can see my memory is running at 42. And so all that means is I'm cutting through these, I'm accruing skill points that are memory based really fast. And um, so I am, again, doing all this, not because I want to learn processing, but because as a, as a experienced player, all the skill points I'm learning before the patch hits and all this goes away, all those skill points, they come back to me as unallocated skill points, which allows me to put those anywhere I want, anytime I want. And it's, uh, it's a really good way to keep yourself flexible. So if you're in a situation where you uh, need to be able to fly something and you're limited because of skill points, you'll have that unallocated batch that you can just apply you know, into whatever it is you're, you're doing. And this is good for like, you know, when when they drop um, the Zenitra, the uh, Triglavian Dreadnought, you know, and you you or or any of the Triglavian branches of ships. Those are new, 
you probably didn't train into them over the last decade or whatever. So you can get right into those ships right away. Uh, so yeah, that's what that's what that's good for. It's also really good for training your weaker st uh, attribute skills. So if I'm training into uh, flying ships, but I need some boosting skills, well, those are charisma skills, and I don't really want to remap to do that because I don't need that much of it. And I don't want to spend a whole year remap to charisma. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll use unallocated skill points to buy up those skill points without having to change my training focus in that direction. So that helps. All right. <clears throat> hey, Mike Porter, how are you doing, buddy? I actually wrote you an email in game. I, I don't know if you got it, but uh, yeah, good to see you. All right, I've been going way longer than I expected to go. I just wanted to give you guys the heads up. If you haven't already, you should be training, reprocessing. Get those as unallocated skill points during the next patch. So check that out. All right. Uh, you guys have any questions before I go? I'll, I'll be back. I think I'm going to do Sunday talking in stations and he's, he's back into doing some, you know, some more stuff. Uh, I can feel my voice is going already. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to look at chat and, and talk with you guys as much as uh, I normally like to, but uh, here we are at TIS. Join our Discord. Let's see, I'll get that up for you. If you guys want to see a good show uh, yesterday, as opposed to this one, uh, yesterday, uh, Rundle and uh, Nick interviewed, uh, is it Yibby? Yibby Yabby, something like that. Anyway, he's the NSH, well, former, not NSH leader, because NSH actually fell apart, but he is the Elysian. Um, executor, I believe, who is the, uh, everybody that was in NSH that kind of got pushed out of NSH because it imploded and it got taken over by people who were the former leaders, basically took the rug out from the people they left it behind. Uh, so those guys that fell off the rug, those guys all formed themselves back up again and they're called the Elysians. And that was a good little show. We talked about what happened, how it was, how it came to pass that NSH lost all their stuff and how they recovered and what they were gonna do next. I think uh, Elysians are allied with uh, Fraternity. Fraternity is a mostly Chinese group. They have, a, I believe, a European contingency and, uh, and, they're, and they're very powerful, especially because they kind of own a certain time zone. That's very powerful. But what they don't have is a real strong US contingency. So I think Elysians mostly play during uh, U.S. time zone will kind of ally themselves with fraternity and patrol in that time range. I think that's kind of the deal they have going. But there's but no if it's anything official. All right. Yeah, I don't. Uh, LB there, LeBlanc, who's joined. We're really happy to have LB join Talking in Stations. He's a good guy, knowledgeable, does his own thing in the wrong alliance. Uh, that's actually the alliance name. Uh, it's called Wrong Alliance, or What Could Go Wrong. <clears throat> and they're actually fighting for space <clears throat> uh, down south with uh, Army of Mango in that area. They're fighting what appears to be Fire Coalition. That, I think we talked about a couple days ago on Wednesday, so you check that out, show out too. And uh, Artemis also did a show by himself where, you know, he's great at just going, ticking off what all the players are up to and stuff. So Talking Stations has a lot of cool content coming at you all the time. And you can always find us on Discord and talk with us there. So for more EVE Online, come to Talking in Stations. That's it for me today. I will see you on Sunday. And uh, fly safe.